are or who you identify yourself with, we together can make a difference. We're going to start our program tonight with a moment of silence. And during this moment of silence, it's really important that we remember our friends and our neighbors from all corners of the world, from Texas to Florida to Puerto Rico to Burma to um, Bangladesh to India. So let's take this moment of silence and please set an intention for the evening. that the most powerful player prayers or the most powerful intentions are the intentions that come from the heart. So um, each one of you was able to join together with a powerful intention. So and by a show of hands, um, can you just raise your hand? How many of you were aware that last Friday, September 1st, was Eid al-Adha, this festival of sacrifice? Excellent. By a show of hands, um, just raise your hand if you knew that um, you had a friend, a Muslim friend, a Muslim co-worker, and you were able to connect with that Muslim co-worker or that Muslim friend and just say, Eid Mubarak, or ask them, how did their Eid go? By a show of hands, how many of you were able to do that? Okay, a few are around. The reason the Muslim Community Center Interfaith and Outreach um, Committee actively does monthly programming is to make sure that our house of worship is open to all of us. We're getting to know each other, we're communicating, we're um, developing relationships, we're developing friendships. So our program today, Justice in the Workplace, is really a three-pronged approach. First is understanding Eid al-Adha. From there, it's understanding Labor Day, and from there, it's understanding how we can be active influencers in the justice in the workplace. So when we think about Eid al-Adha, the celebration that just occurred on September 1st, it's called the Festival of Sacrifice, and it's very similar to what the stories in the Torah, the Quran, and the Bible talk about. Prophet Abraham, he goes to his son, he tells his son, I've had a revelation, I've had a dream. Um, God has spoken to me and God says that I need to um, sacrifice you. Of course, the son is a bit bewildered, but he says, did God tell you this? And um, Prophet Abraham says, yes, he did. So at that point, with no hesitation, the son turns to the father and says, because God has spoken to you, I will acquiesce to this. <coughs> yeah. And then... Um, the son is on the um, platform. The father has uh, the sacrifice that he's going to do with the son. In the place of the son, immediately a miracle occurs, and there is a sheep placed. And when um, Abraham goes to sacrifice his son, he's not sacrificing his son. He's sacrifice, sacrificing a sheep. That's the one main story that um, we as Muslims, um, as well as Christians and Jews, uh, recognize together. And we also um, celebrated last Friday Eid al-Adha for that sacrifice. The next sacrifice that we connect with Eid al-Adha is the sacrifice that um, the resilient, powerful Hagar has been asked to do. So there's Abraham and his wife Hagar. And Hagar is asked by her husband, um, I've been given a revelation. I need to take you and our baby son to the desert and leave you there. And once again, Hagar, um, Abraham's wife, turns to her husband and goes, God told you this? And he goes, yes, this is a revelation I got from God. And she says, if God told you that you need to do this, then once again, I will 100% agree with you. And they go to the desert. Um, Abraham leaves. Uh, there is this resilient, gritty mother wanting to take care of her son, baby son. She leaves the baby son on the very hot um, sand. There's no food. There's no shelter. There's no water. So there's this mother running back and forth, back and forth in mountains looking for shelter or water. And um, you think about, wow, how did this mother do this? But she did it because she had faith in God, and she knew God wanted her to do this. 
and actually running back and forth, and this is very similar stories to um, Judaism and Christianity, she sees her baby son on the ground with this gush of water coming out, and she's like, oh my God, that was a miracle. So God took care of her, and she didn't just um, become complacent and not do anything. She also actively looked for shelter and water and food. So that's our story of Eidl Adha. And that brings us back to our holiday on Monday. So Monday, how many of you enjoyed Labor Day, got to clean the garage, got to have a barbecue? Okay, good, good, good. So Labor Day comes to a, a, a great meeting where we as um, Americans, we realize that the labor union worked really hard to set certain standards in place, to set hours of work, to set um, the work conditions, to set um, fair wages. So as a democratic country, we were able to set these standards in place. And because of that, during Labor Day, we are able to acknowledge the hard work, the grittiness the unions have done and set a standard for our um, laborers. So you've got Eid al-Adha, you have Labor Day, and now we're coming to our topic today, which is justice in the workplace. And we're still struggling to get labor and justice in the workplace, and we're still struggling for fair wages and um, you know, equity in the workplace. So in today's topic, we have these four um, really grassroots community activist speakers, and our MCC Interfaith and Outreach purposely chose these four speakers because all four of our speakers, from um, Rebecca Chi to Erie Brendan to Jeff Axelrod to Suzanne Sehlul, are four speakers, um, four individuals that are really founded in the sh Chicago land, and they understand how important it is to be influencers. They understand how important it is to have your voice heard, because if you do not have your voice heard, then someone else is speaking for you at the table. So um, we're going to start off with Rebecca and Erie first. Rebecca will speak for 10 minutes, and Rebecca, is, you have her bio right at the table, so I'm not going to read anyone's bio, but I will tell you, Rebecca um, is an immigrant from China. She came here, and um, during the process of having her mother get her uh, residency, her immigration process, she saw how difficult that was. And through that difficulty, she actually stood up to her parents and said, no, I'm not really going to be a doctor, I'm not going to be a lawyer, but I'm going to be the voice for the immigrants. I'm going to work um, and help people become the uh, fabric of American society that they are now. And she's gone on to be, um, have tons of accolades, but understood through her power of her voice, um, be the executive director of IBEC, and speak about the uh, immigrants and how powerful they are in the business world. Eri, our second, second speaker, who's going to speak for about 10 minutes, from her personal point of view of being a immigrant as well as um, coming from Mexico from with her parents and going through the entire process of um, becoming a DACA recipient, going to college. She's the executive director of... Um, <laughs> The, the director of National Partnership. National Partnership at the Resurrection Project. Um, she went through the hurdles of making sure that uh, DACA recipients are valued. They're able to go to college. They are a fabric of American society. And Erie and um, Rebecca will speak about how yesterday with President Trump presenting the program that contributes $200 billion annually to the United States economy, how it fuels jobs, how it gives almost a million people a shot at the American dream and how that dream has been taken away from almost a million people. So they've got very personal stories that they're going to share with us. So I welcome Rebecca and Gary to the stage. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much, uh, MCC, Donas, for having uh, me uh, speaking today. And it's an honor to speak with Ere and, and Suzanne and uh, new friend Jeff. Uh, I just I've worked with Ere and Suzanne for many years uh, around immigration reform. So, um, just like Donas said, I'm an immigrant from China. I came when I was 10 years old. Um, so my parents were of the generation that um, when they graduated high school, um, the Cultural Revolution ended in China. And so instead of being sent uh, to the countryside to plant potatoes and rice and get re-educated, 
uh, they were able to apply for college. Um, and so uh, both my dad and mom went to medical school and my mom was actually four years ahead of my dad and was my dad's um, teacher or, um, and that's where they met and they got married. Uh, my dad was a heart surgeon in China and my mom was a pathologist. And um, around 19, um, late 1980s, uh, they were both a resident uh, in Beijing uh, in uh, their respective hospitals and um, uh, during the Tiananmen Square uh, protest in 1989, uh, my father uh, was a heart surgeon at a hospital and you know when the uh, police started and the army started shooting at the students, um, you know the bodies uh, and the injured were taken to my dad's hospital and he uh, um, you know would help the students, get them on their feet, and then they left. And so my dad tells a story about how you know, in the weeks afterwards, the uh, People's Liberation Army would come to his hospital and say, hey, you know, why did you let the students leave, right? That they are, um, you know, quote unquote criminals, they, uh, um, and you know, we, we, we need to lock them up. And you know, basically my dad just said, look, you know, that's my obligation as a doctor. I took an oath that I treat people. Um, and um, at, you know the, the truth of injured, and so uh, so that um, and afterwards he began to see that within his hospital uh, people uh, who were yeah, uh, had less experience, less skills than him were promoted over him, and so basically he was on a blacklist by the government. Um, so that you know kind of synced his decision of um, um, you know I wanted to go to America. And so around 1993, there was a delegation of doctors from Harvard that went to my dad's hospital um, and decided to sponsor him to come to America, to Boston, and study and get his postdoc. And so that's how my mother and I um, uh, arrived in America. My dad came on an H-1B visa um, through Harvard University and then sponsored my mother and I, and we were both on H-4 uh, visas. Um, so, um, like, you know, like Dada said, the reason I got involved in this work um, is because uh, you know, my mom, my dad and I uh, got our green cards, we became citizens, and my mother's case was just always pending and pending, and you know, we didn't really know what was going on. And so, around 2003, um, we hired an attorney and filed a FOIA, and from the Freedom of Information Act, we found out that um, she had. Uh, in order of deportations, right? She was um, undocumented in order of deportations. And so um, you know, I tried to go to attorneys and see uh, if I could sponsor my mom through my citizenship. And we probably went to about 10, 12 attorneys who all said, look, you know, it's after 9-11. Um, right? You know, the, the, the data base between uh, the federal government and um, uh, you know, law, local law enforcement was all being shared, right? And so that she's much safer actually being in the shadows. And if you apply for her and reopen her case, even if you have, um, you know, family sponsorship possibilities, it could put her at real risk that she could, you know, be immediately deported. And so, um, you know, I was in Chicago. I, I went to University of Chicago, and um, you know, I was sort of on the track of. Uh, the major in econ, I was going to be an investment banker and go to corporate law and make a lot of money and like a good Chinese daughter. Um, but I was graduating college and, and my mother was scared, right? I mean, you know, if I don't, if I call her and she, you know, I don't hear from her for a few hours, you know, I think maybe the police detain her, right? And, 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 and I think for me, and I think for um, a lot of people that may have family members who are undocumented, it wasn't even just the act of deportations. Um, you know, I think if you know, my, if my mother just gets some, they arrest her, get her on a plane, and then she goes back to China, that's one thing. I think the other thing is just detention, right? We hear all these awful stories of people that are detained, our court system is so backlogged that then they are trapped in detention for months and months. You know, and my mother has hypertension, she takes, you know, a cocktail of drugs and, you know, you know, who knows what kind of access to healthcare she'll get in detention center, probably not very good. So anyway, so that's how I basically got involved and um, uh, got uh, really active on immigration reform. 
Um, I, right after college, I started working for in a statewide organization called the Illinois Coalition for Immigrant and Refugee Rights. I was an organizer um, in uh, doing electoral organizing in Chinatown, Bridgeport, McKinley Park, uh, sort of door knocking my my neighborhood, my community, registering voters and. You know, back in 2008, the idea was that if we, you know, grow the voting power of the Asian community, the Muslim Arabs, the Mexicans, the Polish, right, um, our vote is our power, and we can get a comprehensive immigration reform, right? Um, so we did. Obama was elected, and uh, a lot more people got deported. Um, but I think that um, you know we did build the muscles for a lot of very uh, pro-immigrant legislations at the state level, right? And, you know, working with Suzanne and Ere and, you know, um, Suzanne's husband, Dr. Sambul, as well, we were able to get driver's licenses for undocumented immigrants in Illinois, right? The, the Illinois Dream Act. Um, and then around 2014, uh, my boss, currently my boss, um, John Rowe, who then was in his last year as the chairman of Exelon Corporation, um, the parent company of ComEd, uh, decided to form this uh, Illinois Business Immigration Coalition, which I work for. Um, he convened, um, now we have over 80 Illinois-based CEOs, uh, such as uh, Rick Waddell of Northern Trust, uh, Carol Gordon Siegel, the co-founders of Crate and Barrel, the Illinois Chamber of Commerce, Illinois Farm Bureau, Restaurant Association, hospitals, hotels, um, so employers, right, um, who employ a lot of immigrants, their industries depend um, on the talent, entrepreneurship, work ethic of immigrants, that's a high and low skill, uh, and, and you know, we uh, support comprehensive immigration reform that expands high-skill, low-skill visas and create a path to citizenship for undocumented immigrants um, in this country, right? Um, so the data is really clear. Uh, immigrants in Illinois represent 17% of our population, um, but um, you know, immigrants uh, are 21% of low-skilled uh, workers and immigrants are also 27% of our high school workers. So um, I'd like you to picture an hourglass, right? Um, so immigrants disproportionately represent our high um, and low skilled workforce, disproportionate to our population, right? So immigrants really fill the gaps that are needed by our economy, right? And immigrants really are who our economy Needs so we know right the gardeners the 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 law uh, the, the the nannies the people that clean the hotel the janitors right are immigrants but so are the engineers and the doctors and the nurses and the architects right are also immigrants um, and so um, you know it's one of the reasons why you know our coalition has been um, uh, very active especially since the elections. Um, around the need for uh, you know, a pro-business, pro-economy um, immigration uh, legislations. Um, you know, for example, since the elections, one of our more vocal members um, has been uh, dairy farmers, right? Dairy farmers in Woodstock, dairy farmers near Peoria, uh, who depend on their immigrant workforce to take care of their cows and baby cows. And unlike soy, corn, that's more uh, mechanized, uh, uh, harvest, right? Uh, uh, animals and um, depend on you know, year-round care by our immigrant workforce. Um, so I'll just end by saying that uh, Eric can speak more to this, right? Yesterday, President Trump decided to end the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program. Uh, for our businesses, that's uh, uh, over 130 uh, recipients of this program. Um, who are engineers, chemical and electrical, managers, teachers, doctors, attorneys, who in six months could lose their work permit and could be laid off. And statewide, that's 36,000 people who are in the workforce that could get laid off, right? You know, yesterday we saw the CEO of Microsoft says, you know, before you can get to, um, my DACA engineers that work at Microsoft, you have to come through me, and I will pay for their attorney fees to defend and protect them here, right? Um, and so, you know, I think a call to action for everybody in, in this area is that we, we, we need to get
get people like Congressman Roscom and Holgren to become co-sponsors of the DREAM Act, right? So there's a legislative solution um, to DACA. So I'll just end it here and um, welcome any questions, but thank you very much for having me. Buenas tardes. Uh, my name is Miranda Redonda Variega. Um, it's my full name. Um, and I am from uh, the most beautiful state and the most delicious state in all of Mexico. If anybody wants to guess. Yeah, I heard Oaxaca many times, I think. So I'm from Oaxaca. Um, I uh, was born there and um, when I was a baby, when I was eight months old, um, my dad decided that he was going to, well, my mom and my dad decided that my dad was going to come to the U.S. and he was going to work. Um, and his plan was always to work for two years, send money home, and we were going to build our house, and in front of it we were going to build a little store, um, and he was going to move home. Um, and we were going to live happily ever after in 80 degree weather, that is the constant beautiful weather of Oaxaca. Um, but after about four years, um, my mom realized uh, that he wasn't going to go home. Um, and so she told my dad, you either have to send for us or you have to come home. So he sent for us. Um, and I came when I was four and a half years old. I uh, was reminded when you spoke about your story about the way that I crossed. Um, so I did, I crossed um, the desert. I crossed by um, in uh, California. Um, and my mom was that same mom. student to ever tell her that uh, and she didn't know what to tell me she had no idea how I was going to be able to go to school or how I was going to be able to pay for it um, but she told me she was going to help me figure it out and she did um, and I was able to go to the University of Illinois in Champaign um, and uh, when I got there I realized that um, what was worse than being undocumented was being undocumented and being alone it was the first time I felt completely isolated um, like nobody knew all of the thoughts that were going through my head. Um, 
And all I was thinking was like, why am I making my parents pay all of this money because we don't qualify for um, any financial aid um, if at the end of the day I won't be able to work. So um, luckily, um, my parents continued to pay. My mom uh, insisted that I go to school because that's the only reason she came here. Um, I graduated from college in 2008, um, and after graduating, I met Becca. By the way, Becca is my best friend, so that's good. <laughs> um, so that's why she like tears up whenever I tear up, and I can't talk about my mom and not tear up. Um, so. Um, and then I've been organizing around immigration and immigrant issues for the last uh, nine years. Um, and uh, together with Becca, uh, working on things like the driver's license campaign, which is what allowed my parents to get their driver's license. Um, and for five years, um, and um, actually on November 19th, which is Becca's birthday, on November 19th of 2012, I got my DACA. Um, and for the and then a few weeks later, I was able to go and get my driver's license. Um, and the day after I got my driver's license, I drove to Springfield um, to lobby um, and to pass driver's licenses for the undocumented, until my mom and dad could also get their driver's license. And um, so, so what DACA means for me, and what it means for the. There's about 800,000 DACA recipients um, in the country. There's about 42,000 DACA recipients in the state of Illinois. Um, what it has meant for us is a social security number, uh, uh, work authority that we do have to um, we do have to renew every two years, um, and we each pay $495 every two years to do so. Um, and it has meant that I've been able to work and that I've been able to establish a career. Um, I feel like before I was I have actually worked at the same I worked at the same place since before then. Um, but my, just like everybody else, actually my income has increased 42 percent uh, because we all of a sudden can think about our future versus before where we were just trying to make it day to day. Um, with the cancellation of DACA, what it means is that starting March 6th, so starting exactly six months from today, approximately 1,400 people just like me are going to lose our work permit every single day and 1,400 people are now going to be uh, are now going to be able to get deported. We're not going to have anything to protect us from our deportation every single day. So we have six months to pass legislation. So as Becca mentioned, as a call to action, um, it is uh, activating your networks. It's calling Ronscom. It's calling Hulkring. It's calling LaFood. It's calling every single Republican uh, elected uh, congressman in Illinois to make sure that they will vote and that they will co-sponsor the DREAM Act um, or similar legislation um, and making sure that our Democrats don't keep pushing this aside. Like, I can't wait any longer. I can only wait until March 6th. Um, and uh, that's uh, really what we're looking for, is making sure that we have a permanent solution because I don't want to feel this way again. Um, I, felt this, I felt this exact same way when I graduated from, when I was about to graduate from high school. And I felt this exact same way when I was about to graduate from college. Um, and now I feel like I'm at, a, I'm at a point in my life where I have to work and I have to I have to pay my rent, I have to pay my bills, just like everybody else. Um, and without any work authority, it's just going to become more and more difficult to be able to do that. Um, so I ask each of you to please call your representatives. Um, and if you have already a representative that is supportive, that you activate your friends and your family and your network to do so as well. Thank you so much, Becca and um, Gary, for really letting us into your um, inner circle of thoughts and feelings and letting us be part of your immigration story. And we're going to now transition to um, all of us have an immigration story, and we're going to find someone at the table to tell our immigration story and how important our immigration story is and how it really makes us who we are. Before we go into table talk, we have question and answer time, so we have about two or three um, questions that if anyone has for Erie and Becca on how to move this conversation forward, how to make sure that the DREAM Act doesn't have to happen in six months, but can happen in September, it can happen in October, how we need to make these stories being told. So questions for Erie and Becca. 
Yeah. Hi. Hi, my name is Jason. Um, so the Dream Act is uh, legislation that's been on the table since 2002. And a lot of policy experts have been saying that this move by Donald Trump to end DACA is really a strategic move to get he, you know, he, now he can say within six months, he can say that it's Congress's fault. And so it's an attempt for him to have a bargaining chip to get things that he wants, like a border wall funded. Uh, so if he demands that Congress, if they, if they pass a dream act that there's additional riders like uh, more funding for more ICE agents, uh, stricter immigration controls, a border wall, how do you guys, it's not really a labor question, but how do you, do you feel that that's a trade-off for protection for you and the other 800,000? Is that a trade-off that, that is, is a point you're willing to make? So, um, I'm, I think I'm a, I personally am of the mindset that we fight for um, legalization, whether it be a path to citizenship or not, right? Uh, for um, as many people as possible. Um, and that that's what we fight for. Um, and I don't necessarily think that, I, at least for me, like I don't have the power to say like, oh, uh, to stop everything bad that gets placed on that bill. Um, I think that there is a line, right, that we say like at some point we don't support it. But I do think that like we're pretty powerless in terms of um, the actual like me saying like how much I would support something or not. I think I as an advocate, me as like somebody who's come, you know, who is uh, undocumented, need to just stand up for my rights, need to say what I am for, um, and try to push that as much as possible. And that's why we do need to talk to our legislators to say like this should be a clean bill, and that that's what we should always be. Uh, that that's what we should always be fighting for. Um, I don't know exactly what a bill would look like and so I have no idea to say like out like I would accept one million dollars but I wouldn't accept a hundred and eighty million dollars I have no idea right um, so I just push for what I believe in um, and um, right now I think that what we're trying to what I push for um, is that at least the 800,000 people uh, that are going to be losing our protection from deportation and losing our ability to work and losing um, our ability to make a living and to help our parents um, that we should be that we should fight to protect everybody yeah I mean and then think that the key difference between what's happening right now and I think you refer back to maybe eight ten years ago right when the dream act um, was on the table and it failed um, is that you know we're, we're seeing this huge shift in our country where a lot of people, right, both on both sides of the aisle, um, you know, people that are, you know, that regular people working, living in our communities, are participating in this democracy, right? Whether they're supportive of the issue or they're not, right? We saw this in this last election, and um, you know, and we saw that um, the day after the travel ban was instated, right, all the protests at the airports. Plus all of these, you know, a hundred some CEOs, right, protesting, and and that was you know, not completely eliminated, but it really was dialed down in terms of the policy and reaction um, to this protest. So, like what Donna was saying from the very beginning, right? I mean, there's it's a very Chicago speak. If you're not at the table, you're on the menu, right? And I think this year, what we've seen is lots and lots of people are trying to get to the table to try to, you know, sort of shift and have a say in what the policies in our, in our country. And so even just in the last 48 hours, as crazy and as horrific and inhumane this announcement was on DACA yesterday from Trump, we've never seen this level of support uh, from unlikely allies for dreamers. For And it's not even just a question of these 800,000 anymore, it's a question of who we are as a country. And lots and lots of people are trying to, you know, try, try, are, are trying to advocate for, you know, who we believe we are as a country. So, um, and even just tonight, I think this is an incredible turnout of like an incredibly diverse group of people. And you know, would we have had this year, last year, two years ago? I don't know. I don't think so, right? So, 
you know, I think that that's that's the question. Yeah. One more question. It's a really good point. It's a good turnout for a Wednesday night, for a working night, for all of us to get here and realize the importance of our presence to hear this conversation. Um, Debbie. Yeah, um, in, in the short run, is it, a, is it an option for some dreamers who, you know, assuming the worst case scenario that people are uh, deported or threatened with de deportation is marriage, adoption, um, you know, to citizen, um, and, and the third choice, you know, your employer says this person has a skill that is not available. I mean, there are other individual solutions for people, right? There's some individual solutions, not for everybody, probably just for about, um, it's like less than 15%. Um, so marriage sometimes works. Um, the issue is that for Mexicans, most of us cross the border. Um, if you cross the border and you marry a US citizen, in order to adjust your status, you have to leave the country. Upon leaving the country, you get a 10-year ban, and so you have to then apply to be able to, uh, a waiver to get rid of that ban. So it's really a trap specifically for Mexican immigrants because we're the ones that tend to cross the border versus coming in with a visa and overstaying our visa. Um, that's like, it, it, so that's one example of like just the complexity that happens um, even on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and then um, in terms of employment-based um, sponsorship, it's very difficult and it's really risky. One is you still have that 10-year ban also. Um, the other is um, it gets really complicated because you're, you could just, if you fail, uh, it, you could then get deported. Um, so in, in general, it's very, you have to demonstrate that there's nobody in the U.S. who could fill that gap. Um, could fill that role, that job, and so um, it's very costly, uh, it's very dangerous, um, so I don't really know anybody who has been able to adjust their status through that. You can ask um, Rebecca and Erie questions later on, but it's really important when we get together at events like this that we get together with a um, sense of, oh, I've developed a relationship with someone. I see someone as a person, not just as a name, or um, they're, they're, they're just a person. So what we're going to do right now is we're only going to take two minutes because we're already about a few minutes behind, and I want to make sure you guys get home and get to bed on time so you can get to work on time. Um, so we're just going to take about two minutes. You're going to find someone at your table that you haven't seen before, that you haven't spoken to before, and tell your immigration story in just a minute. Talk about your parents, your great-grandparents' immigration story and how that's affected you. And then the next minute, listen to the other person tell their immigration story. And I think the more we put stories to people, then we are not the other. Then we're not scared. Then we're not like, oh, they can get deported or they can be sent to jail. It's, oh, my friend Rebecca's getting sent to, you know, if something's happening to her. Oh, my friend Jeff is going through a struggle. So start putting names and stories to people's faces and please make this conversation move forward. So I'm only giving you two minutes, I'm sorry, but find a new friend and tell your immigration story. <laughs>
getting to know each other. So um, as we move on, what I need, I just, I just zip it. Zip it. All right, everyone needs to stop. That's just enough socializing. Okay. Actually, you can tell I'm a mom and I'm a teacher, so. All right, so we're going to go on to our second part of our um, program. And like I said, we purposely chose four speakers that were um, real influencers, that were the fabric of American society, that really are going to get us to get off of our lazy uh, behinds and get us to be motivated. So um, our speakers that just um, spoke, Becca and Gary, they really got us to understand the um, voice and the a vision on the how to move forward with the immigration story, how to move forward and make sure that Dreamers Act is definitely something set in place, not in six months, but hopefully before six months. Our next two speakers, um, again, are influencers in Chicagoland. They saw an opening and they went for it. And um, our next speaker is Jeff Axelrod. So Jeff um, lives in Wilmette, and he quickly realized that the Wilmette board um, was going to vote to opt out for the Cook County's minimum wage increase and pay uh, sick time requirements. So what he did was he just galvanized the Wilmette community. He just said, hey, you guys, let's connect with what's happening in Northbrook, what's happening in Lincolnwood, what's happening in Evanston. Let's find out what the boards are thinking. Why are they choosing not to uh, increase wages? You know, 875 that's a lot of money, but um, how would it be to change it to $10? Of course, 875 is not enough. No one can survive on minimum wage. But he made sure that we understood analytic analytically how to move that conversation forward. Jeff created this uh, Wilmette social justice team. He sends out emails. He gets his Facebook updates. He lets us know what the, when the next meeting is and how to prepare for it. So here's an opening that Jeff saw, and he got a whole group together to work towards um, fair wages, making sure that we are um, having equity in the workplace. Um, our next speaker, and our last speaker, is going to be Suzanne Akros Sehlul, who grew up in a household that was a very activist household. Um, she lived, uh, were you born in uh, America? No, in Syria. In Syria, okay, so she was born in Syria, and she'll give us a little information about her upbringing in Syria, and then when she came here, she realized also the immigration story, how important it is to connect to um, everything that's happening in our surroundings. So as she grew up, she realized um, there were a lot of refugees coming in from Syria. Uh, her and her husband have worked very actively with Syrian Community Network as well as the Syrian American SAMS, which is Syrian American Medical Society. Syrian American Medical Society. Society. And um, she filled a void. No one like told her, hey, you know, Suzanne, we're going to give you a million dollars. Would you like to do this? She totally stepped up and she said, you know what, I'm going to help out the Syrian refugees. So we're going to hear from um, Suzanne for about 10 minutes and Jeff for 10 minutes, and then afterwards we'll do some Q&A. So Jeff, we can go ahead and get started. Thank you. So about a month ago, uh, Jill Nas approached me and asked if I'd present a talk about my activism and discuss the Jewish perspective on social justice. The last time I've spoken publicly, I was probably about 10 years old, uh, very nervously reading a book report to my elementary <laughs> school class. <laughs> so I offered my wife Cheryl as a substitute. And she's, back. she's a good public speaker and she's comfortable doing it. Dil then said she was looking for a man to talk. <laughs> The other three speakers are obviously women. Um, so the next day, I figured my way out. Um, I called Dilnaz and told her I found the perfect guy. He's spread right over there, actually. Um, Herb, the head of the Northbrook Working Families Coalition, he told me he'd be happy to take my place. So Cheryl and I often talk to our son, Evan, who is also back there, I think. Evan? <laughs> um, we talked to him about what bravery is, that it's not about being without fear, but actually being afraid to do something important and doing it anyway. We tell him the more you are afraid you are, the bigger the opportunity for bravery. Dilma's made it clear she really wanted me to talk, and obviously I'm here, though I am terrified. <laughs> I think this is an important point that needs to be made. If any of you here are holding back on making a difference because you're afraid to engage in public discourse, 
canvas door to door, speak up at a board meeting, or even run for office. Don't wait for someone else to do it. My activism was uh, sparked on election night last November. Um, I watched the results come in until I couldn't stand it any longer. I switched to meditating. At around 10 o'clock, I looked up the bookie odds, 95% for Trump. I went up to share the horrible news with my 15-year-old daughter and began to sob uncontrollably. Now in danger was our nation's decency, civility, and maybe even democracy itself. We were all of a sudden legitimizing intolerance and the fear of the other. The lesson learned from the Holocaust was to never forget and to never let it happen again. I now feared the real possibility of tyranny. In the week after the election, I lost more than 10 pounds as I mourned our country's loss. Now, I'm happy to lose a few pounds, but I really would have preferred Weight Watchers. <laughs> A couple weeks after the inauguration, <clears throat> I visited the Skokie Holocaust Museum, actually, <laughs> to learn about Suzanne and her husband's amazing work with Syrian refugees. I arrived early and spent some time by myself wandering the halls. Uh, the museum is laid out in a chronological order, and as I started through the museum, I wondered how far our country had metaphorically ventured so far. I watched a film playing discussing how the German government was confident they could keep Hitler in check. This was sounding awfully familiar. I'd recently spoken with a friend at Temple about my fears of the rise of fascism in our own country. She told me that her mother was a child in Germany during the Holocaust and that the rise of Trump terrified her that Kristallnacht was going to happen again. As Jews through history, we've been scapegoated, pushed out, and demonized. One of the lessons of the Passover holiday is that once we were strangers, and therefore we shouldn't treat anyone as a stranger. I was treated as a stranger and dehumanized in my own home growing up, not allowed to express my feelings or to be myself. I think because of this, I feel especially compelled to advocate for those unfairly blamed, exploited, or underrepresented. Just before Halloween, our new neighbor, a block down the street, <clears throat> began setting up an elaborate and growing political display in front of his house. On first glance, seeing life-size dolls representing Abraham Lincoln and Donald Trump, seated next to Barack and Michelle Obama, it looked like some kind of poor taste political joke poking fun at everyone. As time went on, we started to notice what seemed like outright racist symbolism from the black-faced President Obama dressed in an orange pimp suit to what looked like African-American bodies hanging with nooses around their necks. About two weeks after Halloween had passed, uh, my wife and I decided to go talk to the homeowners about their offensive display. On our way, we stopped by a liberal neighbor's house. When she answered the door and we asked her to join us, she said she didn't want to get involved. Now is the time to stand up, I thought. If, I, if they can't confront a neighbor and his stupid mannequins, when tyranny actually rises, who's going to step forward and shelter our kids in their attics and basements? Cheryl and I approached the upsetting house. We said to the man, Halloween was like two weeks ago now, and you probably don't want your neighbors to think your family is racist. Two days later, the display was still standing, untouched. So a group of us organized a demonstration in front of the house. The neighbors did decide at the last minute to remove the most egregious parts of the display. The next painful event I ran up against was shortly after I learned about Nutrier's Civil Rights Seminar Day in the newspaper. The school was devoting an entire day to teaching about tolerance and empathy, and they invited noted civil rights leaders to speak. It made me so proud and excited to live in such an upstanding community, especially in light of the new national climate. 
And then I read on and learned there were a few vocal residents speaking out in criticism. A lament neighbor, Paul Trainer, ended up creating a long-form documentary about this. He told the story about the people who fabricated the controversy. The movie explained what seemed to be their ultimate goal, harming our public schools so the profiteers could funnel tax dollars over to their shady internet-based homeschooling program. Our community pulled together the money he needed to make this film happen, even when Paul was threatened by libel lawsuits by some of the people anticipating being exposed in the movie. Thank you, Paul, for getting involved. When our April 4th local election began, or the campaigns began, the shenanigans only grew. I learned that right-wing outsider groups appear to be funding their own slate of candidates. I'd also found out that the year before, a Koch Brothers national group mailed out flyers spreading misinformation about Wilmette's planned beach renovations, of all things. During a town hall debate, I was particularly upset by one of the candidates speaking in favor of making it unaffordable for non-residents to access our beach in order to, as he put it, encourage proper behavior. Talk about a dog whistle. I took these revelations as another obligatory call to action and worked hard to canvas and spread the word about what was happening in our town. The outsiders lost the election by a margin of three to one. By the middle of June, just when I thought I could relax, go back to my normal routine and enjoy the summer, I learned that Wilmette's Village Board was creating an ordinance to reject Cook County's minimum wage. Really, Wilmette was doing this? I did read with pride, though, that over 70% of Wilmette's residents actually voted in favor of the increased minimum wage and earned sick leave. So again, I felt compelled to spring into action, organizing the Wilmette Justice Team, where we've been meeting to figure out how we can spread the word to fix this injustice. Tikkun olam is a Hebrew phrase which means to repair the world. And in modern times has come to mean a call for social justice activism. This isn't just a suggestion, it's a responsibility. A common Jewish prayer book includes one called A Prayer for Our Country, published well before the current administration. It reads, May citizens of all races and creeds forge a common bond in true harmony to banish hatred and bigotry and to safeguard the ideals and free institutions that are the pride and glory of our country. Amen. In the ancient words of Rabbi Tarfin, it is not your responsibility to finish the work of perfecting the world, but you are not free to desist from it either. Felt good to tell my story. Thank you for allowing me to talk. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Del Nas, for uh, organizing this uh, wonderful event, and thank you to MEC and MCC for hosting. Uh, I love coming to this community. Uh, I see myself as a, a community girl um, that I've always been uh, either part of the Mosque Foundation in Bridgeview or the Universal School or Aqsa School, all these um, community organizations that uh, I've either belonged to or worked at or volunteered with. And um, thank you for opening your space and allowing us to be here. Um, uh, so I was born in Syria uh, back in 1972, so I'll admit my age. Uh, my father actually came to the, uh, to the U.S. He came to Chicago uh, in the 1960s. This is when um, the U.S. had opened its doors to uh, many who wanted to immigrate to the United States. Um, and he came to Chicago to study engineering. And he met my mother here in Chicago. And my mother's Canadian, actually, so she's not Syrian. Um, and she, her parents are immigrants. Her father's from Ireland, and her mother is from Scotland. So I'm a mix of many cultures. So, <laughs> so, um, uh, so my parents, after my father graduated uh, with his engineering degree, uh, they had my two older sisters, and they decided to go to Syria, and I, that's why I was born there. 
Um, and we lived there for about 10 years. And in, 19, in the mid 80s, uh, you know, my mother had um, kind of had enough uh, of living in Syria because there was uh, there were some uprisings at that time. And um, if you know a little bit about Syria's history, uh, we've lived through a dictatorship for the last 50 years. Uh, we're going, through, we live through a dictatorship now, and um, before that it was his father. So uh, there were many uh, young people who were organizing, and you know, those uprisings were crushed terribly. And so my mother was really afraid for us, and so she decided to, uh, she wanted to come to the United States, but she could not get a visa for me. And so speaking of, parents who wanted to leave their uh, daughters. <laughs> um, everybody kept telling my mother, well, why don't you just leave her and go to the United States? Your two older daughters have uh, US citizenship. Just leave Susanna, you know? And so she couldn't do it. And, um, and so what she um, decided to do is to apply for Canadian citizenship for me. And the minute she got uh, the paper saying that uh, I, I am a, a citizen of Canada, uh, she booked her flight, and we came through JFK, uh, and I didn't even have a passport. So that's how I entered the United States, uh, through my Canadian citizenship. Um, so, so my mother just couldn't bear to leave me uh, in Syria. And, um, and so then my father had no choice but to come here because he, he knew that, um, you know, he was afraid that, you know, he thought, you know, they're going back to, you know, to the United States and they're going to be lost. And, and, um, and my mother kind of forced him to come, to come here. And so, uh, they agreed that, okay, we'll come and live in, in Chicago because my two uncles were living here and at least we would have a community uh, here in Chicago. There's the, um, uh, you know, a young immigrant community, there's mosques, you know, that we can grow up uh, with friends and colleagues and, you know, part of being part of a, a larger community. Um, and then in, um, uh, in the mid-80s or in, in the late 80s, my father enrolled me in um, the Aqsa School, which was the very first uh, Islamic uh, private school. Uh, all for, for girls. So we were 36 girls uh, in the very first year and um, I could say it was a great experience and a terrible experience. Um, the community was learning through us. We were the community guinea pigs, but, <laughs> but it was okay. We turned out okay. Um, and so we have uh, the, those 36 girls, all of us, we have reunions and we have a very special bond, so, uh, which is great. Um, and then my um, I met my husband here in, in Chicago. He had come from Syria to do his residency, and he was at UIC. Um, and I, um, I had met him through a, a mutual friend, and um, and we built our life together. And we have three children. Um, my husband was, uh, uh, and myself were always involved in the Mosque Foundation community. Uh, we worked uh, in a committee called the Social Service Committee, we, where we would try to help low-income families. Um, and then part of that committee is that we opened a food pantry, which is still running today. And, it, and every week they serve over 300 families, low-income families, Muslim and non-Muslim families, which is really great. It's become a source for the Southwest suburbs, a very good you know support for the Southwest suburbs. I, so I used to go in the truck and go to the uh, food depository on Pulaski and pick up food and bring it back and, and have my children help me sort out the potatoes and the vegetables and everything and, and so that we can serve the needy families of, of Bridgeview and the surrounding areas. And so that's kind of how I got my involvement in, into the community. And I think I learned the most uh, you know, when I was working for the food pantry and that was a great experience. Um, and then I was involved with um, the Council of Islamic Organizations of Greater Chicago, the CIOGC. Um, um, my organization is a member of that. And, um, um, and so I'll, I'll fast forward a little bit to the Syrian Community Network. I'm the founder and executive director of a, a community-based refugee support organization that works to help Syrian refugees resettle with dignity. All of you are seeing that saw the news and what's happening in Syria, and it, you know, it started out as a peaceful protest. Uh, ended up in a terrible crisis and a refugee crisis, um, and um, and so once I learned that Syrian refugees would be coming uh, to the United States, um, when the State Department had announced in 2013 that um, um, the Syrian refugees will be resettled, I know that Chicago is a hub for many refugees. We have uh, Rohingya refugees, we have Iraqi refugees, Somali, we have uh, refugees from every conflict uh, in the world, and I think this is what makes Chicago so vibrant, so amazing. And so, uh, but I knew that. Um, you know, we need to support them as a community. And so that's when we came together um, and we formed the Syrian Community Network. And right now, we are serving about 175 families um, in our office. We just opened our office uh, in Edgewater. Um, so we're really proud of that. Many of our families live in uh, in the north side nearby 
um, uh, Rogers Park, West Rogers Park, but we do also have families that are resettled through World Relief, and World Relief has their offices in Aurora and in Wheaton, and so we do have some families out in the West Suburbs. So we basically serve families from Evanston to Aurora. So we have some families uh, resettled in Evanston, we have in, in Skokie. I see that the mayor of Skokie is also here, um, and um, and so it's it's become a, a, a nice community. And what's and the reason why we named the Syrian community, we put the word community because it really does take a community to welcome and to support refugees of every kind. And in time, we hope to grow and serve other refugees, not just Syrian refugees, because this is what our faith mandates, that we serve the, the poor, the needy, the refugee, um, and, um, and, and do that to the best of our ability. And as we grew, as, as the organization grew uh, slowly, um, we started hiring uh, employees. And so um, this, you know, um, speaking of workplace justice, and you know, uh, I always, I'm always fearful that uh, I would uh, at, at any time uh, hurt or harm my employees or be unjust or be unfair to them. And so I live, so my husband told me, well, why don't you live by this motto of this hadith? This is a hadith, is a, uh, the saying of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him. And so I'm going to, just for the sake of time, I will just read the translation of the hadith. So the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, your brothers have been given to you, and God has made them under your hands. If you have people under your hands, then feed them from what you eat, and dress in a way that you look like equals. Don't overwork or overburden them with so much work. If they have much work, then help them. So sorry, this is the translation is kind of weird. The Google translated, kind of translated. So I live by this model uh, all the time, that I'm very cautious of the way I treat my employees, that I'm fair, that I'm just, uh, and that I try to treat them. Uh, I think I do. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I wish my employees were here right now. Um, we're all together six, myself included. Uh, but um, uh, I, I, I try my best to be fair and to be to be equal. Um, another um, one thing that's uh, part of our work that we work with IBIC uh, and ARI and the Protected by Faith and the Illinois Business uh, Coalition and with the Illinois Coalition for Immigrant Refugee Rights. And I also now have been working with a new group, um, the SEIU Local One, which is um, an organization that works with workers and um, different unions. And um, today I was at the co press conference for uh, the airport workers. So we have, there's some success. So airport workers, uh, and, and many of them are refugees. And we do have some refugee clients who work at the airports. And as you know, um, many of those jobs are cleaning the airplanes, um, stocking you know, the different restaurants, cleaning bathrooms, things like that. And, and the work conditions are not really that, that good. And at first when I heard that, uh, you know, a lot of the refugees would always complain to me, we don't want to work at the airport. And I didn't understand why they didn't want to work at the airport. But when I started attending the meetings and hearing the stories, I realized, yeah, it really is difficult to work at the airport. And, I, when I, and now when I travel, I'm really conscious of what, um, you know, who the workers are. And many of them are, like I said, we have some Syrian refugees, we have Rohingya refugees that work there. And so today's press conference was a celebration um, that the, their, the minimum wage now is at $13.45, uh, $13.45. And that's a great victory because they were asking the, the, the campaign is five for fifteen, um, but and, and many of them were getting nine, uh, paid nine dollars or ten dollars, and some eleven dollars, and some were not getting paid. There's a lot of wage theft also. Um, so the victory is that they reached at the thirteen dollars and forty five cents, um, and they're hoping that in time, if more people uh, add pressure, that the, the uh, wage will be at fifteen dollars. So inshallah, God willing. Um, and so. Again, as, as Muslims, as, as people of faith, as people who want to be just, we want to be fair uh, to everyone who um, does any kind of job. You know, this is part of workplace um, uh, justice, I believe. Um, and so, one thing I just want to close with is that, um, yes, we have, I, I, I advocate for Syrian refugees, and um, anytime there's anybody that says anything terrible, you know, um, my son says, you know, oh yeah, Mama once uh, hit us or, or something like that. They make, they make fun of me, you know, that, you know, uh, don't let uh, anyone, Mama hear that uh, they're talking about Syrian refugees and right away I'm on the, on the news or, or whatever. Uh, but I just want to inform everyone that we have amongst us uh, Rohingya refugees here in Chicago and they have a center on Divan. 
and they really are struggling. I mean, what, I don't know, I'm sure you're watching the news and you're seeing all of the, what's happening to the Rohingyas uh, in Burma. And so I think all of us as a community, we should reach out to the Rohingya Center in Divan and um, offer our support, our help, our love, um, and I think because they're going through a difficult time. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne and Jeff. And I think what we're hearing from all four of our speakers is that, um, of course, the four speakers are influencers. They're very impact impactful in our society. But each one of us is an influencer. Each one of us can do something to help Rohingya refugees, to help um, you know, move the Dream Act forward. But each one of us has some power. So how are we going to use that power? So that's the tabletop we're going to do right after Q&A. So I've kind of like sparked your brain to think about what is your next step? What are you going to do when you walk away tonight at hopefully 9.05, we should be done. But um, when we're done, what are you going to do? So um, right now we have some time for Q&A, so any questions? Jeff, can you mention uh, a couple of things you're doing now with the WellMed Justice team that perhaps other communities could try to model after? Sure. Um, let's see. So we're meeting monthly. Um, we uh, have some signs, yard signs on order uh, that should be delivered on Friday that we're going to start uh, going door to door, uh, canvassing, telling people about what happened because I think many people in Wilmette don't actually know that the Cook County, that Cook County raised the minimum wage, uh, let alone the fact that Wilmette, um, you know, uh, backed out of it. Um, so we're going to, for the people who are sufficiently upset, we're going to offer them yard signs to, to display. We've been talking to the trustees one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Um, what else have we been doing? Um, there's, you know, no end. We've got door hangers. We just want to educate everybody um, because, you know, like I said, 70% of Wilmet voted in favor of the minimum, the increased minimum wage and paid sick leave. and. We want people to know that the trustees, you know, voted against that. Any other questions? Suzanne, can you talk a little bit about, about the wraparound services that um, recent refugees need? What are the wraparound services that you feel are most important that now we as a community can help uh, these refugees work with? That's a great question. So um, our organization is uh, seen as a mutual aid association. A mutual aid is uh, we work with the resettlement agencies in tandem uh, to offer the cultural and linguistic support that refugees need. Um, uh, so we're not a resettlement in the terms that, that we rent the apartment and get the furniture and all of those things. Even though we've done it, we've had to do it a few times, but um, what we provide are mentorship services, uh, mentorship support, uh, where we pair people uh, with uh, a family. Um, people will come in and we, we train them and we'll do a, a background check and then we uh, uh, pair you with a family. And you as mentors would be helping them with navigate life and helping them in, in their adjustment. You might um, uh, help them with school issues, whatever they have, you know, problems with their children. Um, or if they need to go to the market, and you'll show them and or take them to a museum. Uh, kind of basically showing them what Chicago is all about and welcoming them and, and making them feel supported. Uh, many of our mentors even teach English um, to some of the women because some of the women don't go to ESL because they end up, you know, staying home with the with the children, but the men will go. Um, and so the mentors really serve an important role. Uh, another program that we just started, and we're really proud of this, and I'm uh, just like ecstatic, um, is that we have case management now. We have two case managers, or three case managers, I should say. Um, uh, one of our case managers works out with uh, works in the uh, western suburbs with the families that are in Aurora, uh, and now we just hired two new case managers who are overseeing all of the issues of the families. Um, and so this, this frees up my time to focus on strategy, on building the organization, thinking you know big picture instead of me doing everything. Um, and so now our case managers can do that and they're helping them find jobs. Just last week we were able to secure five jobs for five families. And that will make a huge difference for those five families. I know it's not a lot, it doesn't seem, seem like a lot, but it, it is a lot because, all, because we were not able to do it before, but now we're like, all of a sudden able to do it. Uh, in October we're gonna start offering ESL. Um, and so, also, we're very excited to do this. We're going to be working in partnership with Truman uh, College, 
where they will um, hire a teacher specifically for us and, and they will be teaching ESL at our center. And so this also gives the uh, comfort for the refugees that they're in a community center. Not everyone can go to a college or a community, co or a community college or a center where they can have to navigate and figure out which building, which classroom. You know, it's, it's really overwhelming when you don't have the language. But if they're coming to a community organization where they feel comfortable, then it's it's the I think the learning will go um, you know it, you know it will be it's just so much more beneficial, um, and so and we also do uh, rental support. Uh, we, many uh, of the refugees have difficult times paying uh, time paying their rent, and so we supplement a part of uh, a very small portion of their rent uh, for rental support for about six months just to kind of get them on on their feet. So those are our three main programs. And we're also looking to start an after-school program uh, for many of the, the children who their parents have asked us, please, can you help our kids relearn? They need to be retaught the lesson. Um, and so we're going to do um, uh, two days uh, out of the week for middle schoolers and then two days for high schoolers. Um, and then we're going to incorporate some art therapy and like, you know, having talks about, you know, social media or, or your body, being comfortable with your body. What does it mean? What does this mean? You know, these kids are coming um, uh, and the parents don't understand the culture of the high schools here. And so we want to help them navigate. And, and they're seeing things that they, that they would not see in Syria in a high school. Uh, so. Um, so we're trying to help them to navigate through that, to understand, you know, how you know how to deal with these these stressors. Um, so that's something that we want to incorporate in our after school program. We're really excited about that. And so we need volunteers. So anybody who wants to volunteer, please, please, uh, you know, um, talk to me or, or fill out our form, and, and we'd love to have you. One last question, Gail. Yeah. Just to piggyback on that, when you were talking about rental support, so. There's a saying that um, there, there are win minimum wage jobs, but there's no minimum wage housing. So to the extent that in all of our communities we can be advocating for housing that reaches a whole range of incomes. I know in Wilmette there's, um, there's a proposal to do some affordable housing at the Old American Legion site. There's work going on in Evanston where there's just a proliferation of luxury housing downtown and people being pushed out. It, you name the community in, in Northbrook, there's uh, people going after uh, an assisted, affordable assisted living facility. So, um, so there are ways to get involved. On the flip side of the job question is the housing question. Point. Okay, so we are going to take um, the next four minutes, and what we're going to do, like we said, it's very important for you to walk out of this um, house of worship feeling like, oh, I connected with a new person, I heard a new story, I understand someone else's uh, you know, way of living. So once we start having these conversations, we start developing relationships. So now you're gonna find a different person that you haven't spoken to earlier this evening. And what I'd like you to do is, um, one person speaks for two minutes, and that person talks about, Walking out of these doors, what am I going to do? Uh, how am I going to make the world a little different? How am I going to impact the world to make it a more just, more safe place? How am I going to help um, you know, move this Dream Act conversation forward? What stories am I going to share about my immigration process? And then two minutes for the other person to talk. So let's go ahead and talk for about um, four minutes and find a new person to talk with. Thank you. <laughs> Two months of program at MCC, and 
We make sure the programs are very timely and we invite guests that are uh, knowledgeable and timely on the topic. And if you want to be part of this email list, um, Anjum, who's way in the back with the um, salmon colored scarf, has the uh, list. So make sure you sign, uh, <laughs> um, sign that list so you can be on the email list. The next uh, thing is I just wanted to say thank you to Becca and Erie and Suzanne and um, Jeff. This is our really difficult times. Um, Jeff talked about you know losing weight, and I think we've all had really difficult times since maybe the last year. So I think it's important that we discuss these things and not live on our little you know um, live underneath our covers and think we're the only ones struggling. It's better that we struggle together and we cry together and we commiserate together and we get over it together. And it's also important that we realize, you know, there's a higher being out there, and we can do just as much as we can. But ultimately, someone else, some us, uh, uh, you know, a higher being is going to take care of the rest of it. So we're going to close with the Imam. Um, imam Majur is our spiritual leader, and he's going to do a closing prayer for us. Well, thanks so much to all of you for coming and taking part in this wonderful. Uh, educational event and program and you know whenever we have a program when we invite people we really 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 we really appreciate people coming and attending because if you throw a party and nobody comes then you feel really bad <laughs> but uh, but uh, you know 1.5 million people here alternative facts you know it's it's really, <laughs> really it's uh, really motivating for all of us so uh, I wanted to share one very important statement uh, from Prophet Muhammad about uh, justice at the workplace where he mentioned that you should pay the laborer's wages before the sweat dries. You should pay the laborer's wages before the sweat dries. And this statement is quite clear and self-explanatory. Workers are to be paid on time. If a person is hired to do a job, the person should be paid immediately. However, if there's a contractual agreement, that wages are to be paid weekly or monthly, then this is what must be done. So the most important thing is that, as we see that individuals, they stepped up and they did something. They made an effort to bring about a change. And that's what the golden rule is. And this golden rule is found in Islam and Christianity and Judaism. And in general, uh, you know, people who have no beliefs as well, as well, they have this rule which guides their life. And, and the Islamic golden rule is that none of you have true faith unless you love for others what you love for yourselves unless you love for others what you love for yourselves so as we depart this evening and tonight and we are reinvigorated and we're we're stronger in our bond in our future intentions uh, you know let's all make an effort that we won't leave whatever we heard we won't leave it here but we will make an effort to bring about a change and sometimes that change starts off slowly like uh, Beverly was mentioning about prevention of gun violence and the efforts which they are making and you might find some uh, papers on their tables if you can sign that as well and that will be appreciated by her and it will make life easy for her. So as we conclude, let's uh, finish with some prayers and some spiritual thought. God, strengthen our resolve to give witness to these truths by the way we live. Give to us understanding that puts an end to strife, mercy that quenches hatred, and forgiveness that overcomes vengeance. Empower all people to live in your law of love. God, give us all the resolve to stand for justice and to work together to ensure that people are treated fairly. God, give us the resolve to build alliances which reinforces a traditional relationship between labor and religion. God, workers being laid off are looking to the traditional sources of support, labor unions, the church, the synagogue, the mosque, and other community service organizations to fill the gap that's been created. God, let us be together with labor. Let us be on the picket lines. Let us be before Congress and to organize workers around the country to fight against the cons consolidation of wealth. God, all those who are afflicted by hurricanes, wildfires, earthquakes, and other natural disasters, Give us the courage to help them out in whichever way possible and give them the inner resolve and fortitude to pick themselves up again. I mean.